Hi. Okay. Uh, I'm Danny Marin, and let me start uh, not with the title, but let me start showing you a quick video. What do we see here, apart from what Tomas has shown before? Uh, we see a binary black hole merger. What's this? This is a process uh, after which uh, two black holes come into very close contact together and they merge. So this process converts two black holes into a single, more massive black hole. This is an extreme process in nature. This is a process that releases enormous uh, amounts of energy. Uh, in this process, we see, uh, we can see uh, deformation tides in the structure of space-time, and these tides are called uh, gravitational waves. Now, uh, this process is uh, not a theoretical one. We've actually detected these ripples in space-time in what we call uh, gravitational wave detectors, which are very massive michelson moly interferometers. Now, this process starts when the black holes are very close to each other. And by very close, I mean uh, for stellar mass black holes, this is about 0.1 astronomical units. This process kicks off when two black holes are at approximately the distance between the Sun and Venus, so extremely close to each other. Uh, this is not a rare occurrence. As you can see here, this is uh, a stellar graveyard plot. This meaning uh, all the detections, all the detections that we've seen, uh, black holes merging, this is called uh, a graveyard plot because those black holes do no longer exist, but they form uh, another more massive black holes. You can see it here, the arrows. Uh, this plot uh, is, is very interesting because we can see uh, these are the gravitational waves produced by black holes, but also by other compact objects such as neutron stars, which are less massive. Now, uh, for black holes, we detect uh, a rate, a merger rate. So we detect gravitational waves at about 44 black holes mergers per cubic gigaparsec per year. Now, this is an extreme amount. And as a matter of uh, historical approach, when the experiments, the, these uh, gravitational wave detectors were first uh, developed, we expected to see only binary neutron star mergers and less important binary uh, neutron star with black holes and binary black holes as the least important contribution. This is actually the opposite. The, mo the, the most common process is binary black hole merger. Now, uh, we did not expect that because we have, uh, in order, I, I, I repeat this, in order to kick off this process of gravitational wave emission by binary black hole mergers, we need to have two black holes at about the distance between the sun and Venus. This is extremely close. And the universe is big and black holes are relatively small. Now, this begs the question, how? How do black holes get so close to each other? Now, how do two black holes that are maybe separated in the universe, which are not that common, how do they get so close to each other? Now, there are three possible mechanisms. First is binary stellar evolution. Black holes are together because they formed from two stars that are bound together. They are orbiting each other. Now, let me uh, give a quick runoff of the numbers. We've said the black holes are separated by 0.1 astronomical units. This is about 25 uh, stellar radii for the most massive stars. Therefore, that's about the, the Sorry, 25 solar radii, which is about the radii of a massive star. What we're seeing here is that in order to produce a binary black hole that merges, the stars have to actually touch each other. This is what we call the common envelope phase. Now, this common envelope makes the, the orbit shrink, and therefore it allows for the merger. This common envelope phase also introduces a lot of uh, uncertainty in the parameters here. So that's uh, a highly studied topic now. 
also another uh, way of producing these uh, mergers is due to dynamics in stellar clusters. We have regions that are clusters with very dense uh, population of stars and black holes. And in these regions is where the, the mergers actually happen due to their dynamical interactions. Here, it's only uh, Newtonian gravity. So it's not until they are actually very close that general relativity starts to kick in. Uh, a third, uh, somewhat argued, uh, less important channel, or not uh, actually 100%, is primordial black holes. These primordial black holes, as, as we've seen in, in previous talks, uh, are formed due to the collapse of over densities after the, the Big Bang. Uh, the problem that these channels have, all of three and, and their mixing, is that they can all reproduce the merger rate, these 44 mergers per gigaparsec cube per year. So we need to disentangle them. We need a method to say, OK, where are the mergers coming from? First of all, let me talk about this uh, dynamical channel, which is the, the topic of the talk. Uh, this dynamical channel, uh, pretty much as, as a stellar structure, uh, in stellar structure, a star should collapse into itself. Why doesn't it do that? Because there's some process of giving energy to the star. This process is nuclear reactions. For a cluster, we see approximately the same physics. Uh, why doesn't a cluster a set of stars collapse into each other? Because there's something giving energy to the cluster. This is binary shrinking. So in a cluster, there's a central binary that gets smaller and smaller. And that energy that's getting more and more negative is then shared with the cluster to avoid it to collapse. Now, how it do, does it do that with three body interactions? You see a star colliding with the binary or interacting with the binary. The binary gets smaller, and the star therefore carries that energy to heat the cluster or say that the cluster does not collapse into itself. Now, there's only one central binary in here, and this has been verified for most massive clusters using simulations, but more on that later. Now, how do we separate those channels using the gravitational wave data, which is what we observe? There, we said that uh, the merger rate can alone, cannot alone separate the channels, but there are some parameters on the gravitational wave data that are, that are candidates to do so. For example, uh, the spin. We know that in common envelope, uh, the spin is, is aligned. The spin of the black holes with, with we find that it should be aligned between the black holes. That does not happen for uh, dynamical interactions where the spin of the central binary that's formed due to dynamical interactions need not be aligned. For primordial black holes, uh, most theories assume that they are non-spinning. So this could be detected. Uh, disadvantages of this approach, we see that the black holes form from uh, stellar evolution spin very slowly. So that doesn't allow us to disentangle the channels. Uh, neither we can with uh, redshift dependence. As we can see, quick runoff. Uh, for binary stellar evolution, we expect the mergers to follow the star formation rate naturally, or maybe with a short delay. For dynamical interactions, we expect almost flat, but peaking at some redshift uh, when the clusters were more active. And for primordial binaries, we expect a uh, steep high uh, Z dependence. That is, uh, more mergers, the, the closer to the Big Bang that there is. Uh, the problem is that the detectors have a limited horizon. They cannot observe at arbitrarily high redshift. And therefore, this, this uh, signal doesn't allow us to, to disentangle uh, the origin. What does allow us to disentangle the origin of a gravitational wave is the eccentricity. The eccentricity in the orbit, if we see eccentricity in the orbit, uh, it is necessarily come from dynamical interactions. So this is a key point. Let me say it again. Uh, if we see eccentricity in a gravitational wave signal, then that signal has had to come from dynamical interactions. 
and this is a key point in here in this study. Now, what I propose to do, or the work that we are carrying, is to understand stellar, stellar clusters from the, the gravitational wave data. That is, to understand their cluster properties, as in a uh, big set in, in a quasi-thermodynamical approach, that is their mass, their radii, their velocity dispersion, and understand the small processes that is related to the eccentricity, masses, and etc. of the gravitational wave signal. What does this allow us to do? This allows us, for example, to constrain the, 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 ch the formation channels for gravitational wave emission. And for example, if we constrain those channels, we are able to constrain, let's say, uh, primordial black holes and therefore constrain uh, their representation as dark matter. Now, we have, uh, to, we have to simulate how those uh, star clusters evolve with time. How do we do that? The most simple approach is to get all these stars and integrate their equations of motions, maybe with stellar evolution and binary stellar evolution, etc. This is a time-consuming, an extremely time-consuming approach. We're talking about to simulate a global cluster uh, would take about a month or so. So this is, uh, if we have a big parameter space, this is uh, extremely complicated. This can be accelerated using uh, n-body simulation, uh, sorry, Monte Carlo approximants, but still it's not necessarily much, much faster. What that leads us is to the de development of fast codes that are able with some degrees of assumption to to simulate clusters at the cost of some uh, accuracy. Uh, for example, I'm, I'm giving here some names of codes that some have been developed by, by colleagues here. CBUHD, Flask Cluster, yep. Now, if we run those fast models, for example, this is an example of CBUHD, we see that there is a slight under prediction of mergers at low cluster masses. So the prediction is good for high cluster masses, but it's not for, or, or there is a sli slight under prediction for low cluster masses. Yeah, sorry. Uh, this is uh, the n body, let's see, n body simulations, the most accurate simulations that we have. And these are approximative uh, simulations. So there, at low cluster masses, there's this uh, discrepancy. There's this uh, separation. Sorry. Uh, this leads us to analyze our assumptions. Uh, what assumptions uh, have we taken that are not exactly uh, correct? And this is the assumption that we, we are considering now the assumption that the energy given to the cluster is due to the shrinking of a single binary. As we've said, that was verified for most massive clusters. But it may not be true that there's a single binary in low mass clusters, a single active binary. We're not saying uh, binaries coming from stellar evolution or bi stellar, stellar binaries. This is the binaries that produce the energy. The, let's say central binary, binary that's formed due to the interactions, uh, the Newtonian interaction between the components of the cluster. Now, we take a model from the 70s to study this. And this is a very rough model, single mass component. So very, very simple. But we see that the number of binaries increases as the number of stars decreases. And this, this is the, the binary fraction in the core. Actually, for less massive clusters, let's say, open clusters and the lower mass end of uh, globular clusters, uh, we see that the binary fraction is considerable. And therefore, we need to uh, take into account binary-binary interactions. Now, let me show you. This is a binary-binary interaction. Uh, it's been studied, this, in scattering experiments. And it's been shown that even they are less likely because there's usually more 
uh, stars that are not in binaries or black holes that are not in binaries than there are in binaries. In general, those binaries produce much more mergers, or they're more likely to produce mergers. Even if they're less likely to happen, overall, they produce more mergers. So to recap, what we're saying is we're arguing that this under prediction of mergers at low cluster masses is due to this, binary-binary interactions. Now, what's left to do? What is our work here? Our work here is to first uh, understand how or, or do the prediction for binary-binary uh, interactions in low mass clusters. What do we need to do that? We need a model on the population of uh, binary or binaries in the cluster. It's not valid for low cluster masses that there's only one single binary. So uh, my work has been devoted to find this model on uh, the binary population. The result is this. Now this looks extremely close to uh, what we've seen. But now note that this model, here it says black holes instead of stars. So this is a component when there are black holes and there are stars. Now, before we said stars to the minus one third, the number of stars to the minus one third. Now we say the number of black holes to the minus one third. For example, let's say uh, 10,000 uh, component or 10,000 solar mass cluster. Uh, what we see is that it has some number of binaries, but this 10,000 uh, component cluster, it has about 100 for most normal parameters, about 100 black holes. Therefore, what we, s what we see is that it has an extremely high binary fraction. Now, with this model, and this W0 is some measure of the compactness of the cluster, let's say, how compact it is. Uh, this model, we will uh, in the future use it to predict the merger rate and the properties of the mergers uh, in low mass clusters. Now to recap, uh, my work or, or our proposal is that we need a new key ingredient to study uh, the mergers coming from dynamical interactions. And that ingredient is the interaction between two binaries of black holes. And well, thank you. And if you have any questions, please. Thank you for your talk. Uh, there is time for uh, your questions. So. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, so uh, in your talk you focus a lot on the question of uh, how many bi uh, binaries, uh, black holes are formed in clusters of different masses and uh, in simulations, but the observations are just, you know, how many black hole mergers are produced in the end of uh, mass M1 and mass M2. So why is it so important to you to figure out, you know, how this exactly how this binary formation rate black holes dif uh, is on different clusters of different masses if we do not we cannot observe you know the mass of the cluster from which a given binary appeared sorry you could could you repeat the last sentence uh, if since we cannot observe uh, the, the, the the cluster mass from which a given black hole binary appeared uh, why is this question important to you uh, Okay, so uh, first, uh, we know that the clusters uh, are formed following a, a distribution of masses. So, allowing, uh, so finding uh, a relation between the mass of the cluster and the efficiency of the cluster at producing mergers, we could be able to disentangle, uh, given a, a cluster, what's the probability that the cluster produces a uh, merger or produces X amount of mergers. Now, in order to predict, now th this is for uh, smaller clusters, in order to predict uh, how many mergers a small cluster produces, it is necessary to study the binary-binary interactions and therefore it's necessary to obtain a the, the 
a model of the population of uh, binaries that are generated due to their interactions. The ultimate goal is to uh, to be able for one, let's say, one cluster, give it a, a, a mass, and be able to predict how many mergers that cluster will produce. And the other way around, if we see a merger, be able to say it has come from a cluster of X properties. Okay, there is time for one more question. Uh, thank you, very nice talk. Can you say something about the neutron star merger rate? Uh, sorry, no, no, I've, I've only focused on, on black hole merger rate, actually. Uh, the what they can say is that for what I've said for black holes, all three channels can can are, are able to reproduce the merger rate. For neutron stars, the opposite is true. I'm, I'm not too in the topic really, but I'm my, my probably outdated knowledge is that no channel can reproduce exactly this merger rate because I think it's abnormally high due to the population of uh, neutron stars, but I am really not uh, in, in this topic right now. But yeah, thanks for that. Uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again, and let's, let's move on. Thanks.